uh, Shelly has has run into a challenge getting here. So we're going to proceed without her and she may be joining us on the phone um, shortly and she may not. It'll be exciting, but we will figure it out and uh, push forward regardless. Um, so Denise, do you want to get going? Uh, sure. Um, thank you all for, uh, hold on, I just realized, I keep forgetting that my rename doesn't propagate. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, welcome to our session. Um, in the, at the top of our uh, notes uh, that you can get to through from Kiko chat, um, I'll also drop the link directly into uh, the our, the Zoom chat, um, there is a link to our community participation guidelines. Um, I just want to remind you all, to, uh, essentially be a decent human being. Um, but if uh, you have any issues with, um, uh, we encourage you to follow the reporting process that is outlined there. Um, we want this to be a self safe, welcoming um, and inclusive space for everybody. Um, we're working on sharing slides. Um, if we could go to the first slide, just as a, as a reminder, um, we've got a few goals for this session and hopefully they align with what your goals are. Uh, we want, we want to um, introduce you to some existing resources that we have, uh, provide an intro to the process of uh, identifying appropriate repositories, um, share experiences, uh, positive and negative, uh, repository discovery, as well as hopefully try to start identifying some of the gaps in the uh, repository discovery process. So this is uh, kind of a back and forth. Um, we, it, you know, the session organizers wanna help, help you and we wanna learn from you as well. Um, so uh, briefly, um, I think we're, I think the next step is um, Amber. Is that right? Yeah, so we, um, to help inform the conversation a little bit, we were interested in knowing um, what community you represent in coming to this um, to this session. We recognize that people wear many different hats, um, but we're interested in understanding, you know, whether we're talking to a group of earth science researchers, whether we're talking to those that are largely affiliated with a repository and so have a role in data curation or repository management. Um, perhaps you're from the, the non-data publishing community, um, uh, journal publications or some other category um, and we won't call you out to define yourself but just to have a sense of the breakdown in the room um, would be really useful so we have this quick mentee I can see that many of you um, are filling it in and I trust that you all can see the the slides okay so you're seeing that that change as I see it um, and we'll just give you a moment to hey Amber where's that mentee link so if you go to menti.com, um, it's on the screen share right now at the top. And so the it's menti.com and then the code you need is 168884. Hmm. Okay, so apparently we have 47 people in the room right now. So we have a little bit more to go in terms of getting those numbers up. See if we have a... Okay, I might call out the, the other category actually. We have quite a large group of others. So as people are responding, for those of you that um, indicated other, if you're comfortable doing so, um, if you don't mind turning on your mic and, and letting us know which kind of community you're from. Yeah, this is Doug. If you don't Phil's want to, that's okay. Hey, Doug. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Hey. Uh, so I'm, I guess the community I'm from is probably more the geoinformatics community, and, and in particular, yeah. some of the people that are involved in the semantics and things like that. And so I'm particularly interested in how to connect repositories into graphs, into knowledge graphs, and to represent them in terms of 
publications, data sets, things like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in that aspect of it. Cool. And as that is changing, I should say on the other um, side of the screen, you'll see the notes session um, people have started to indicate who's attending. I can do a, a screen grab of the participant list as well. Um, each of these little bullet points, it's there for you to grab. Um, it's really great if we have a collaborative note-taking practice because it's hard for any one individual to capture the, the full range of the conversation. And I put a, a whole lot of empty bullets in because I know it's also difficult knowing where to chime in. So you're worried about writing over other people. So if you want to to um, pop in a comment or a thought. We're currently in the welcome and introduction section. You can just grab one of those bullets and, and begin on typing. Okay, marvelous. So we have a, a large number of people that have come from the repository community, which is it's probably not surprising. Um, a group that are uh, more from the research community and then also, um, as we have from Doug, others that don't classify themselves necessarily as explicitly with repositories or directly kind of primary research. And, and that is all good too. Your perspectives are welcome and hopefully we have some great content that is, is useful for you. To see the discussion um, before we get into some of the presentations about existing resources, we wanted to ask you a couple of questions. And the first one, and if you're not a researcher, maybe kind of put, put on a hat of thinking about researchers that you interact with or researchers that you work with or that you support. Um, tell us a little bit in some uh, free from text in the next mentee, which if it'll let me move on. There we go. How do you currently select a repository for your data? And so, as I said, if you're not actually collecting and publishing data, um, but you've encountered and interact with people that do, can maybe per perhaps answer this from, from their perspective. And so it's a free form text response and we'll, be, we'll start to see some of your answers um, coming up and these will get recorded and so we can enter them into the notes later, um, but just to help seed the conversation. So if you can do this during Menti, um, it's a little bit more of a dynamic process and we can take a look at your thoughts. Okay, so institutional repository, Google, uh, data to a repository self-select, we recommended by publishers, talk to colleagues, peers, PI lab mates, and other peers, institutional recommendations, journals, Okay, repository finder tool, federal agency. Okay, based on discovery, talking to peers, another one. Um, looking at the catalog for the data that they have. Recommendations from the domain. Okay, federal agency science base. Okay, this is great. Fair decision tree. We've tried re 3 data no avail. So we're gonna be talking about many of these resources. Um, the, the decision tree has come up, um, kind of the connections with peers and institutional guidelines has come up. Um, re 3 data has come up. This is great. Cost, I think that's the first mention I've seen of the financial side of things. Okay, don't currently use, but here to learn more, that's great. Data one members. Okay, marvelous. And then we're going to move on and ask you um, another question that speaks more to any challenges that you have encountered in this process. Um, so let's talk about your pain points. Um, what have you found challenging with the process of identifying a repository in which to put your research data. Cost and the volume. <laughs> Too many options, yep. Institutional support, accessibility. 
ease of use. Effort, capacity, inertia, lack of standardization, lack of guidance, time commitment, formats. So based, based on the words that you're seeing showing up, I mean, we're, we're getting some convergence. Well, we have convergence around cost, it seems. Um, guidance, time, effort, volume. Um, I, invite, I invite anyone in the, the group to uh, turn on the microphone if they have um, an experience they'd like to share or a reflection on the, um, the challenges that we're seeing depicted here by, by people in selecting a repository. Or perhaps you might want to explain the words that you put into the word cloud. Hey, Amber, this is Sophie. Hi, Sophie. Hi. Um, I didn't put this in, but that did jump out at me. I saw somebody who put in on helpful staff. And so I thought that was really interesting. Um, I would, um, I guess I should be clarif clarifying that I'm associated with a repository. So I would definitely love to hear um, more about that in terms of the user experience or why, like if that's part of the um, challenge for people to not to participate in uh, or, or to work with repositories, that would be very interesting to me. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. Any thoughts thoughts on that? And I, I won't ask the person that put in unhelpful stuff in case the repository that you submitted to is also in the room right now. Um, but anyone else wants to reflect on the amount of support and guidance that exists in a repository and the nature of that support and guidance and whether that's a, a factor um, for you in terms of selecting a repository. Hi, this is Sarah Ramdeen. I just wanted to say that in thinking about Sophie's question from my own perspective, working at a repository, that part of it comes back to funding again, where like, what is the scientist funded in order to do to support putting things into a repository? And then what is the repository funded to do in order to support the scientists in doing that? Like we often have built into grants things like, we're gonna host webinars on how to use our services and those get nixed because it's not science. and and so I'm probably not phrasing that right and there's more to it than that, but it becomes sometimes there's limitations on how you can support usability in the repository and it, I think it comes back to funding. Yep. Yeah, that's a great point. Any other reflections or experiences that people want to share? Hey, Amber, can you make that slide? Can you can you make your browser bigger? I can. We can take get rid of our notes. There we go. I don't know that I can do it within Mentimeter. Uh, Amber, this is Jay Perlman. I, I would say if the repository subscribes to FAIR or follows the disciplines, so that we're not only getting discovery, but we're getting access that's an important uh, factor. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> well, this is this is great. Oh, sorry, Gary, were you about to comment? I was just about to say that uh, one of the recent experiences that I have had is that a reduction of institutional support from our parent institution um, has been a major source of inability to adopt a particular um, open access and fair repository. So as much as we'd like to um, be uh, repository being no longer maintained or having a reduction in funding itself um, has, has prohibited our further adoption of a, a under supported repository itself.
Okay, well, this is great. These slides are going to be available to us as we move into our breakout sessions when we're having conversations about what's important to researchers and you know how we need to communicate around um, messaging and finding a repository, we'll, we'll have these to refer to. Um, but what we're going to do now is, is move on to talk about some of the resources that do, do exist within the community. And I'm going to pass over to Daniela um, in order to do that. So Daniela, I'm actually going to stop sharing and then you can take over if that's okay. Yeah, great. Can everyone see this? Amber? Yeah, we can see yeah. it, thanks. <laughs> yeah, we can. Awesome. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm somewhat new to the ESIP community. Um, I work at California Digital Library at University of California, um, but I'm the product manager for Dryad and I work on data metrics projects um, like Make Data Count. And so um, I'm kind of representing an institutional repository opinion, but um, why I kind of started working on this is because I actually worked in data policies at publishers before this. And so why I was specifically interested in talking about this today is that I joined the data stewardship cluster and this came up of how do you choose repositories and what's gonna be effective for that? And so I'm just gonna give a really quick preface to what's out there. And then Shelly and Mike Witt are gonna go into a little bit more detail um, with a demo of what uh, some of the options are. Um, so just at a first glance, there are a lot of different tools out there for how you should choose a repository. And there's a ton of different approaches but we have not found that there's any silver bullet yet for what the best thing to do is um, for finding this. And the biggest question I think is how do we actually get to the researchers? Because a lot of these tools we can keep building, but if we can't actually get researcher engagement on them, our, you know, what's the return on our investment into these tools? Um, and so a big question is how much of this should be specific to disciplines? So talking today within the earth sciences world, or is this something where we should all be investing in broad scope tools that cover all types of disciplines because multidisciplinary research is so much more common now. Um, so the first one is of course, fair sharing. Uh, they found it in 2011 and their website is kind of the basis of a lot of work that's going on within repository comparisons, indexing what is a repository that supports fair um, and other things around that, but it's not disciplinary specific. So of the 1,520 that are in there, you know, maybe very few are relevant for the ESIB community. Then of course, sprouting from this community is the repository decision tree, which we're gonna go into in more detail very shortly. Um, but it was built to inform the repository finder tool. And I know that many authors from that are on the call right now. So it'll be great to hear from them to talk about this more. Um, data site built a repository finder tool and that uh, Michael Witt will talk about more, um, which uses re 3 data as the source for it. And going forward, data sites working with the FAIRS FAIR group um, on this one specific point, which is um, having, you know, enhancements to the repository finder tool specifically to more aspects of metadata. And then lastly, maybe something that you haven't heard of because it is not uh, uh, publicly launched yet <laughs> is something called data seer, which um, I put and there's a hyperlink to these slides in the notes, you can see the wiki and also have these URLs. Um, data seer is a Sloan Foundation funded project that's a national language processing tool that's intended to be at the point of journal submission. And what happens is when you upload a PDF um, or a manuscript document, it is reading through it and isolating data types. And then once it has the data type, it tells the researcher or the journal what the preferred um, way to publish those data are, like in what file format, and then repositories, either specific to the discipline or in general. Um, the wiki that's in the uh, notes from the slide deck has a link, uh, the link to the wiki. 
And when you click on that, you can see the different types of data types they're working on. It's an open project. And if folks from this community are interested in talking specifically about data that are more relevant in the ESIP community, I think that would be really helpful. The seed data that they used was from every article in PLOS One and in scientific data. So it might be better to have maybe the AGU journals and others uh, more involved in that. Um, but it's using the fair sharing ontology behind it. So um, this is all really to say, there's a whole lot of these tools. Uh, we're gonna go into more of them in detail. And in the breakouts, one of the sessions is gonna be on how do we get researchers to use them instead of maybe all working on these disparate new tools. So I'm gonna pass it over to Shelly and I can click through for you, Shelly. Shelly, um, I, I, we're having difficulty hearing you. Um, I'm not sure whether your connection is stable or whether you have the ability. The moment. Amber, I just texted her that too. Okay, thank you. Just Just Okay, so I'm, I don't know, um, Shelly, I, I don't know that we're going to be very successful um, with the connection that you have right now. So I don't know what your flexibility is in terms of finding a better connection. Um, and I know that we probably cannot speak to the expertise and knowledge that you have with respect to the, the great work that has been happening. Um, and so do you want to give us some guidance on whether you think you'll be able to find a an, an better connection? Otherwise, um, we'll make a decision here. Are you able to dial in? Yeah, there's a lot of recommendations to suggest just perhaps dial in. I think she might have been calling in from her phone, but I'm not 100% sure. I had had a back channel with her that she was thinking of joining from the phone. Yeah. Right, and it looks like she's dropped off right now. Um, so let's see whether she pops back in and we'll give her a moment. Um, the other thing that Bob is recommending is if everybody else could turn off their videos short for for this part of it, we might help her. Um, so we'll go cameras off. Okay, we do have one phone caller on the line. I don't know if that is Shelley. It's a Oh. It's not Shelly. Okay. Um, I'm almost sure. I think her area code is a um, 240. Um, no, actually, I think she might be 301. Okay, let's unmute. Uh, who is our 301 caller? That might be me. This is Don Collins at NCBI. It is. Yep, yep, yep. yep. It is you, Don. Well, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Thank I, you. I, 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 I can't use Zoom, so I I'm know. doing the best I can here. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Cool. So following what Ted said, maybe could we skip ahead to do the demo and then come back to AGU when Shelly gets back online? If, Michael, you're online and ready to do the demo. I'm here and I'm happy to demo, um, but I have to confess I was, um, I was joining today in support of Shelly, so I was going to follow her lead. Um, do you want me to go ahead and talk through the decision tree and the repository finder tool, would that be helpful? Should we, um, yeah, let's go to slide 17 and we can start with the decision tree. Ruth is here as well, um, because that forms the basis of the repository finder tool. So maybe if we go through the decision tree and then into the repository finder tool, perhaps Shelley will have joined us again by that point. Does that make sense? That sounds good to me. And, and in fact, Ruth was, was the, uh, the lead within our group on the uh, decision tree. So Ruth, if you wanted to take it, that'd be fine with me too.
Um, okay, fantastic. Yes, yes. I'm here. Um, but you'd have to put up the decision tree if you want me to talk through it. I yeah. will say it came out of the uh, the AGU ESIP enabling fair type project that Shelley pretty much was uh, running. Um, and I don't see the decision. Tree. Hold on. I'm, yeah, I'm just uh, popping up the screen share right now. Um, one moment. And there we go. And then I'll go into presentation mode. Okay, could everybody see that? So this is just the background and then part A of the decision tree is next and then part B. So are we ready to move on, Ruth? Yes, I think okay. so. Great. Um, and uh, okay, so I should note that um, this decision tree was developed by a, a number of people and a number of diff different repositories. And it really has two parts. The first is um, what you do if you actually had, um, if you're trying to figure out what to put in a data management plan, in other words, it's way up front type guidance so that you can actually get this all figured out before you even get funded. Part B, which is a, probably the next slide, I would have bet, um, is um, for if you haven't done that and now you're trying to recover, which probably means you don't have any funding in your proposal and and means you might have a bit more difficulty finding somebody willing to take your data. Could you go back to the first one again? Thank you. So talking through it, you know, it's basically a bunch of questions about, you know, does your funding agency have any um, requirements? In many cases, funding agencies do. Um, if, for example, if you're funded by NSF and you're dealing with data in the Arctic, you know exactly where to put your data because they tell you. Um, if your organization has rules about what you may need to do, you need to follow them too. They may say you actually have to put your data in your institutional repository. Note, those two key things can conflict and you may end up having to put your data in a couple of different places and that might not be fun, but it might be what you have to do. Um, if you don't have funding agency or organization um, guidance, well, is there a, a domain repository for your community? Domain repositories often have additional capabilities that general repositories don't have to maintain your data at, in a useful form for the long term. Um, so in general, it's, it's better to have, you know, uh, domain repositories, most of which who are trying to be fair, though I understand funding sometimes can be an issue. Actually, I'd say that funding is usually an issue. Um, and then the question is, is can they take your data or will they take your data? Because you may not be in their mission statement. Um, for example, if you were trying to send data to NSIDC because you're funded by NASA, the NSIDC NASA community um, may not decide that your data is worthy of being um, archived for the long term. Um, and so there's, it's basically literally a decision tree. Um, and, you know, at this point, Cortra Seal is um, you know, the best guarantee that a repository is um, trying to deal with your data in a, in a good way. But as you can see, there's different levels of core trust seal uh, certification, you know, levels of curation. In other words, if all they can do is take what you put in and spew it back, that may not be useful for many of the communities who might be interested in your data, um, but they may do more work. And so there's, you know, four categories there. Um, and so if you have multiple repositories that uh, could take your data, you probably should pick the one with the highest letter, <laughs> in other words, D first. <laughs> um, and so the issue is um, that you may not find a repository 
because the answer might be no to all of these things. For example, I had this happen to me at one point where I had a huge data set. This is now seven years ago or something like that, um, where this whole idea of a data management plan was just starting up. And um, so um, I had gotten funded before that happened. Um, and so I created a data set, but it was actually bigger than a terabyte. And none of the generalist repositories at that time would take it. And um, not without funding, which of course, because this was pre data management plan days, there I hadn't put any in. So um, this particular workflow, um, there were many people who who contributed to it. And I would note that it was an international group. Um, so we had people like Leslie Wyborn and Dana Kincaid and et cetera, um, all working on these. And so this was the best we could come up with um, in general. The big message is, is that when you find out that you're in, you're in trouble, you really need to have a conversation with your funding agency um, about this issue because getting funding for data curation, I mean, a lot of funding agencies don't really want to do that or that's their last concern, but if they don't have the ability to have their people who are doing research have a place to put their data, then that's a problem for them as well. And they need to know that so they can fix that problem. Um, I'm not sure what else you would like to say, uh, have me say about these. But I think that's that's fantastic. Available. Yeah, so these, these are linked from the agenda. These are in Zenodo. Um, and so I, I urge people to take a look at them. We will be kind of going into a little bit more of a conversation about them. Um, during the one of the breakouts. And as I mentioned, um, this decision tree that was worked on uh, as part of the Enabling Fair and, and with Danny and, and Michael and, and Ruth and others um, formed the basis of the repository finder tool. Um, I have just heard that Shelley is dialed in right now. Um, and so if, if Michael is supportive, um, because I don't know how long Shelley is with us, um, maybe we can um, nip back to Shelley's presentation and, and lead uh, right. that way. No problem. Okay, great. So Shelly, um, hi, I have your slides. I don't know whether you can see slides. Um, right now we're on the title slide. So if, if you can't see them, we're okay. gonna guess between us and, and move forward as needed. It, it'll be fantastic. Can you hear me okay? We can, yes. I'm so happy. Um, so thank you. And sorry for all of the confusion. We had a bit of a family thing happening today, as you may imagine. So far, so good here. Um, if you could go to the next slide. So, so we, um, AGU implemented the enabling fair data criteria for journals. There was a soft implementation in March, which at another talk, I'll explain why we called it soft, but it was mandatory in August. And essentially, and, and, and everyone on this call knows it's far more complex than this just one slide shows. But just to make my point, um, we required that data supporting your research is in an appropriate trusted repository. Um, and uh, those words are carefully chosen. Again, that's another talk. Um, and that where there's an availability statement describing where your data is and how it can be accessed and that it's cited in the references. So if you could click again, please, you'll get the words what data and where I think sometimes. And that's indicating that those were the primary questions that were being asked immediately. What data are you talking about and where do we put it? So for this talk, I wanna focus on the where, um, though we all know that what matters as well, because um, the type of data, the nature of it, uh, raw observations versus derived, all plays a role in how we answer this question. Um, next slide. So hopefully you're seeing the data for publication page and this was our initial text uh, that we shared with the community, very, very high level. And, and when I was doing this talk, these slides, I realized I need to rewrite this page. So again, you know, we evolved very quickly. Um, and 
this this was very high level guidance. Knowing a researcher when they're trying to publish will really only read two or three sentences. So they're very short. Uh, availability statement citations, information about repository selection, incredibly high level, and um, uh, and not even giving links to tools. Um, and then our modeling community needed to have some concerns addressed immediately, so we've got a section there. Uh, next slide. So uh, the uh, essentially the 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 the, the feedback we got from the researchers, the authors, was this isn't enough. We still don't get it. And more importantly, our editors were really struggling. They've not, some, some, couple, three, a few, knew what we needed, but mostly they didn't. And they themselves needed tools to give to authors that they felt comfortable providing. So just last week, we... Uh, finalized the first four journal-specific guidelines. And this is, this is them. Because you all are really interested in detail, if you could go on to the next slide, please, which I think lists the 22 journals with uh, links to where you can find the online version of that journal-specific guidance. It's the same page, by the way, that we put the original uh, content on. Um, and it is meant to be a short gap because this session, uh, we're really looking towards more robust tools that we can give our authors. Um, so this is really just a short, uh, an interim stage until we can get more broader uh, uh, tools for, for authors. Uh, and the, uh, the next slide, please, which should have domain repositories. So the journal-specific guidance is supposed to give uh, a quick list, not even a comprehensive list, of what domain repositories aligned more, most closely to that particular journal topic. And for tectonics, you can see what these topics are, and then there are pages below with uh, lists of repositories. Again, not exhaustive at all, but a first attempt. And primarily because we were really challenged with the repository finder tool, um, and I won't belabor the point because showing you the tool will be most advantageous for this conversation, um, but then next slide as well, please. Um, and then really delighted that we have a t something for uh, when you can't find a domain repository, which generalist repository should you go for? And there's this brand new comparison chart out that took a lot of folks to, to actually put together, um, and we're excited about that, but yet it's not enough. Uh, we still need to represent institutional repositories better and, and help this decision-making. Um, and I don't know, if, if Michael's on the line, he has, uh, maybe he can add to this conversation as well. Yes, I'm on the line. Um, and I'm standing ready to do a, a repository finder in the, the part we're approaching. Yep, that would be fantastic. I can, I believe, Shelley, this was your last slide, the generalist, yes. So I'm going to stop sharing, Michael, and you um, are able to take uh, control, I believe. Hang on one moment. Give me just a sec here, guys. All right, do you see the repository finder tool? We do, yes, thanks. Ah, fantastic. Very, very <laughs> So it is a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me to join you. Um, so we got a little bit out of order in terms of the, the presentations. Uh, Shelly was giving some background on the Enabling Fair Data Project and a lot of the wonderful things that came out of it really across the a broad spectrum of fronts relating to uh, promoting, you know, fair data. Um, and then one of those fronts that we attacked was the repository front. And then um, Ruth was talking about the decision tree, which was helping a researcher with a series of questions and in answering those questions, helping them, you know, to guide, guide them to the, to the, to uh, an, an appropriate repository or to the best repository uh, for them to deposit their data. And, the second part of that is to take that decision tree 
and to try to turn it into an online tool. Uh, so it's not just a flow chart, but it's actually, it's interactive. So a researcher could go to this website, repositoryfinder.datasite.org, uh, that we partnered with Datasite to develop and build on top of the read 3 data registry of research data repositories. And so those, those questions were things like, um, you know, what is, what is the norm for your domain or discipline? Um, you know, if you're a researcher, you'd want to re deposit your data in a domain repository if one was available. Um, do they accept deposits? You know, will they even take your data? You know, are they, are they certified as being trustworthy? So core trust seal certification or, or another certification. Um, what level of curation and value added services will they provide to you as a researcher if you deposit your data with them? And then if you don't have a domain repository, um, you know, do you, does your institution have a repository? Um, if not, you know, to steer uh, researchers towards a, a, a general uh, archive like Figshare, uh, Open Science Framework, et cetera. And so really what we did was we took that list of questions and we looked at the uh, metadata schema for re 3 data that we use for describing research data repositories. And we tried to see where we had discrete pieces of metadata that we could build queries to essentially answer those questions. And there were, of course, a number of limitations that we, that we ran into, um, but those were what formed the basis of this tool here. And of course, more has been built on top of this tool here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on see the repositories that meet the criteria of the enabling fair data project here. And check the box. And this, go, this, this list right here is the list of the 222 repositories that um, met the criteria that we came up with that answer those, those questions in the decision tree. And so what that comes down to in terms of the metadata are you know, specifically answering the questions of number one, will the repository take data? Does it accept deposits? So that's, you know, we're implicitly only going to list repositories that will take data. That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, is, the, is the data repository open access? Does it provide open access to data? The third thing is, is it a domain repository in the domain of earth and space science? So, you know, that was the, our, our scope in, in coming out of uh, ESIP and AGU. Uh, so we're looking at earth and space science domain repositories. Uh, number four, uh, will the repository give you a persistent identifier for your data? So a digital object identifier. And then number five, is the, is the repository certified or not? And so what you can do is you can you know, list the whole, um, the whole, all of the repositories here, or if you want to check or uncheck some of these boxes and change the criteria for the search, uh, you can do that. Um, and you know, this is a, we, we took this tool, the first version of it, uh, we did uh, focus groups um, uh, Sophie Howe is on the call. She, she led one of those groups and a, a number of other people were involved. Uh, we worked with uh, um, another, another group to do one-on-one um, -on -one usability interviews with researchers. And we did about, I can't remember the number, it was, I think it was around 20 of these uh, where we you know, basically guided, did a guided interview, usability interview with the researcher while they were using the tool and asking them questions about, you know, do you understand the terminology of it? You know, do you know what it means to get a persistent identifier? You know, um, and do these quest questions make sense to you? You know, what's the usability of the tool? And so that's how we, how we, I guess, operationalized or actualized this decision tree uh, as a as a repository finder tool. Um, and as that was the first iteration of it. And then now what we see is that uh, newer projects are starting to build on top of it. Uh, I don't want to jump the gun, but the Fair's Fair project, for example is trying to you know, build out the core trust seal criteria uh, to include more of the FAIR uh, principles in them. And as those are um, you know, becoming um, uh, identified and agreed upon, they'll be incorporated into the tool also. Uh, but I mentioned limitations and there were, there were a bunch of them. Uh, there were definitely limitations to the metadata. So limitations to you know, the schema for E3 data and to the, uh, what was populating the schema uh, in terms of our ability to answer some of these questions uh, concisely and precisely. Um, there were um, limitations, uh, and this is, 
I think maybe my, my individual reflection, I'm, I don't want to represent the group in this, but there were, um, I think, limitations in being able to positively identify uh, what constitutes an implementation of a fair principle in any kind of granular way. So these, these um, criteria that we came up with are fairly broad. Uh, that's because it was impossible to get more specific or get more granular in terms of identifying this is implementing, you know, I2, yes or no. Um, there were also limitations, and these came out in our focus groups and, and discussions in our, in our working group, in um, the uh, kind of a shared understanding of FAIR among repository managers, among publishers, among researchers, among funders. Um, and without that shared understanding, of course, the usability of the tool is, 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 uh, suffers. And then, of course, you know, the FAIR principles at the time that we did this uh, work, which is at this point a couple of years old, um, they weren't, frankly, widely adopted yet. Um, there weren't as many repositories that were uh, certified. And, you know, especially as you start to get into the uh, machine access and actionability uh, with the data and into the uh, interoperability and reuse, um, many of those implementations in repositories are, are fairly uh, immature and, and, and still are to this day. So uh, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of challenges that still lie ahead, uh, but we have a tool and it's exciting to have a tool and to see it be used. And it's exciting to see that uh, it's being extended and that it will be uh, discussed and, and, and perhaps improved upon in this venue. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to so I'm just going to share my screen now, if that's okay. If you wouldn't mind pausing, Michael. Marvelous. So that, um, those, those presentations kind of set the stage for where things are at right now with respect to the landscape and the great work that's been done through the Enabling FAIR project, project and a couple of the resources that have come out of that. What we wanted to do for the next half an hour is to break out into smaller groups um, and to have a more extensive conversations um, and kind of a working effort on some of the, the, the questions that have emerged um, and some of those uh, different tools. And so we currently have three breakout activities that we had pre-identified. Um, the first one I will be leading, which is break, building outreach around repository decision making, um, because in conversation, it was felt that, that while these resources exist, um, they haven't been promoted extensively within the art science community. And what can we do to facilitate that and support that? Um, really anchoring it around what, what it is that researchers are probably asking or want to know. Um, the second is doing, as, as Michael said, the, the uh, repository finder tool underwent a, a large amount of usability testing. I had feedback. Um, some changes have been made. I think some changes are being slated, but having a group go through the tool and explore the functionality of the find, finder tool and to identify areas for um, improvement or enhancement that can be communicated back to the team. Um, and Shelley was going to lead that. And so we may have to switch some of us around um, because I think it'll be difficult for her to do so. And then thirdly, um, getting researchers to use these tools. Um, you know, how, how do we encourage the researcher community to take advantage of all of these resources that exist and not just letting them know about them, but you know, really working with them um, so that they adopt and incorporate these tools as part of their workflow. And that's something that Daniela was going to be leading. Um, because we do have um, the potential challenge with, with Shelley's availability on the phone, what we're asking people to do is um, if you can rename yourself within Zoom and that way we can see where the interest is. And if there is a large number of people that are interested in, in one particular breakout, um, then we'll move um, the, the team members around to make sure that that one happens. So um, please vote with your uh, renaming process, as it were. And first of all, the first thing we'll do is take a glance at that um, to make decisions about how to move the sessions forward and then we'll break out into those sessions. Hey, Amber, so because... so I am moving people in. Um, Shelly also says she'll be online in a minute. So oh, it might okay, be that Shelly is going to be able to make it. Um, Great. And uh,
People are doing a great job renaming. Um, and if you don't want to be moved into a breakout, just put an X next to your name and I won't move you. Um, you can just hang. I see one of those around. Um, it's no problem. And Erin, we'll regroup um, in 30 minutes just to, to discuss uh, feedback findings and next steps. Okay, perfect. I am almost done. Thanks for your patience. Oops. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> oh, out of context, that sounds really horrible. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so Don, um, do you wanna tell me where you wanna go? Um, and Amber, I can also, I can work with the rest of these guys. Um, after sorry, I open I them. Hi, sorry, I had to unmute myself and unlock my phone and... <laughs> all the um, things, yeah. I, all that good stuff. Um, let's see, I'm just looking to see, uh, trying to figure out where some of my colleagues were going and see if we could not overlap so much. Um, so I think I would I, start out. Hmm, go ahead. I see Monica and A and Paul Lamo and B. Um, I'm not seeing anybody. Obviously, Noah and C. Um, Liz Harper or Phil Jones. I, they may or may not be in this session. Nope, I don't see either of them. Okay. Um, well, you said somebody was in A and somebody was in B, right? Yep. Um, okay, and Liz says she's going to C. Okay. Um, actually, I would like to see uh, try, start out in B, but I may have to okay. change. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, Amber, right, when Amber, you're ready. Ready, hmm? ready, ready, ready. Yes, we're, we're ready, ready, ready. <laughs> oh, ready, ready, ready. Um, okay, I am ready, ready, ready. And so just everybody, if you don't want to go into a breakout, that's cool. Um, you can stay here. If you um, change your mind once you get there, you can just leave the breakout room and you'll come back to the main room um, and that's okay. And if, um, and I can move you around. So um, no problem there. Um, like there's one. Oh, and when the timer ends, you will have two minutes to wrap up your conversation normally. Um, sometimes people are getting yanked back sooner, but um, it should be two minutes. And with that, I will open the rooms. So, and Shelly, we see you and open all rooms. Okay, bye guys. Um, and for anybody who I haven't assigned yet, um, so Kevin, Maggie, Dana, um, if any of you want to go into a room, just unmute and let me know where you want to go. Or put it in the chat. I'm having problems. Put me in C. I think that happened. Um, So Kevin, Maggie, or Dana, just one click, one more quick check-in. My browser, you would like, so Dana, do you wanna go A or B or just choose? A, okay, awesome. I will move you there. And if you change your mind, you can just come back. Okay. Um, Elizabeth C. Awesome. 
Okay, and Kevin or Maggie? before the end of the session. So um, please, I encourage you all to help uh, record the, um, the, the results from your groups. Uh, one minute from each group. So breakout A, Amber or somebody from breakout A. I might designate someone else, Steve. Put you on the spot. Couldn't, uh, I couldn't get away fast enough. <laughs> we uh, we we talked about um, the, the premise of where we're starting, sort of a statement of values or and objectives. You know, we really want to get the data into the repositories, and whether or not the current tools um, are in the right place, inserted into people's workflows, um, and then a statement of or a sort of a clear-eyed view of the audience that we're dealing with, breaking them down, making better relationships with the researchers and really making a more solid quantitative case for data in repository is better for result, better for all, for you and for your colleagues. Okay, excellent. Um, breakout B, uh, someone self-nominate, please. I can do it, Denise. Okay, good, go Mike. So one minute. Um, uh, just to try to summarize, we've got a page and a half of notes, but um, the repository developer tool and looking at how it could be improved, um, I think it was really uh, clear from the, the uh, excellent comments that people made that there's a lot of room for improvement, that the tool was you know, developed you know, a couple of years ago when FAIR was much newer, uh, fewer repositories were certified, and there was less of a shared understanding of FAIR and what that meant for repositories. And uh, I suspect that's probably uh, further along now. 
uh, and that some of that work is worth probably revisiting. And people gave a lot of helpful suggestions uh, in terms of some things that were buggy and other things that could be improved. Uh, so we have projects that'll be um, doing some of those improvements. So I will take the, the notes back and share them with data site and hopefully act, uh, make them actionable. Brilliant, brilliant. All right, group C. Will nominate themselves. Come on, it was such a good discussion. Yeah, so in group C, we talked a lot about a lot of the, the limitations in in adoption amongst the research community. And I think one of the, the surprising aspects of our conversation was is that the tools and processes and the overall um, mechanisms by which to adopt um, use of research data services and data management within the research community are not the limitation is that it's more of a social, cultural, or educational opportunity in that um, we really wanted to sort of complement uh, the, the group dynamic was such that we were hoping that group A would and the education would be a little bit more um, pronounced because the um, the efforts that are that are being developed for engagement um, are are still nascent and, and young and that they're, they're still taking some time to develop um, so the uh, the impacts are are starting to to bear fruit and we're and we're, we're getting there as a, as a community so with first few um, further engagement with um, data management librarians and in earlier in coursework for early in graduate studies um, we're, we're confident that the tools are are mostly already there and are maturing. Um, we just need the community and the human capital to, to catch up. Okay, it is it it is ending time, but if you all would be willing to stick around for a couple minutes. Um, so what do you see as next steps? Well, Denise, funny you should ask, can I make a plug? I already plugged in group A, um, and I think it's great, Gary, that it sounds like we had some aligned conversations going on between group C and, and group A, some of the things you mentioned we touched upon. Um, there are a group of us that are interested in continuing this concept of outreach as part of a Funding Friday. And so if you go to group A, there's a, a link to the Funding Friday. Um, so we would love to, to bring together people that are interested and um, engaged and have skills that we don't have um, to participate in, in that Funding Friday activity. We're going to work on it over the next couple of days. If you don't want to participate, that's great. Just vote for us. That works too. Um, but the idea is that we will actually kind of move forward based on these conversations and develop some outreach materials targeting the right kind of audiences that, that came out of the conversations today. And that, that might mean different materials for different audiences, or we might find something that resonates um, broadly. Um, but that's the plan with one of the Funding Friday activities. All right, uh, any other final comments? Um, um, I think what Gary uh, reported from C that, you know, this is, this is a social problem uh, more than a tool problem, I think is a reasonable thing. And, you know, in, in metadata land, a lot of times we get um, trapped into improving tools instead of improving content. And, you know, continued work on, on content that's in re three data or, or, or other, you know, sources for these things, I think is really, you know, is really uh, a good payoff in terms of effort. Um, tools, we, in this community, there are a lot of people that love making tools and God knows we have a million different metadata editors and the creation of those metadata editors never actually improves content yeah. uh, or adoption. In, in fact, I think so, but, but good content lasts, tools don't. Yeah, well, and I think, I think that actually does align a lot with what we were, what we were coming about with, with group B. Um, the tool itself needs some improvement, but kind of the underlying content um, to work better with the tool, I think is, um, is also. So, so Michael, not to put you on the spot, but is there something that um, you know, the data stewardship committee through ESIP could assist with on that? Or how, what next steps do you might, might see since we've kind of heard from A and C? Well, I think, I mean, for colleagues who are um, in Europe, 
uh, engaging with the Fair's Fair group is is a good idea because I know they're they're interested in input and I know that that is uh, that is that is content that's been really slippery uh, in terms of you know uh, d really uh, defining Fair and how it's implemented in repositories. Um, and then the other thing I just put in in terms of a general plug if we're doing commercials here is uh, you know if you're looking at read three data and you see something that is an error please please correct it or please report it because mm -hmm. you know the, some of these things are it, it continues to grow and get better um, with with time and with uh, broader input so thanks all right does anyone else have any uh, final thoughts comments concerns favorite colors dance routines glasses of wine <laughs> I really wish I could have been in all three breakouts. I just got to tell you that because <laughs> it sounds like there were great discussions in all three. Um, but uh, yes, Shelly. Thanks for seeing my hand. Um, so I, I apologize for not being well connected for you to hear me well. Um, the the stopgap measure that AGU has in place with that journal specific guidance, you'll probably find your repositories in there if you're representing any. Um, uh, some of you, very few of you, I've had a chance to actually speak with about what that text should look like. Um, and we don't want to repeat anything that's already on your websites. We really just want to direct the author to your website. Um, so I will do my best to get an email to you directly that asks for um, updated text uh, that, so that we can refresh and actually put something that you had your hand in that you had some influence over within that guidance. Um, and having worked with a couple of repositories, we're finding that there's actually things that aren't on your website that authors do need to know. Like what's the lead time? Let them know that it takes some time to get things curated. Um, and then, uh, you know, for instance, a little bit more about your terms of use, um, a little bit more about how you work with authors. Um, if not everybody has that content on their website um, and it would be really great to engage on that bridge kind of content. Um, so uh, if you want to go take a look at it directly, it is on AGU's pages right now um, and I'm happy to update that text to align better to what you prefer as a repository. Okay, anything, anything else? Before we before we close down, if you'd like, I can stop the video now. And if people want to continue this conversation, I'll just stick around as the host, and you guys can just keep talking. So, shall we do that, perhaps, or um, do you, anyone have anything else thing they want to say while the recording is still happening? I'm quite excited to see what happens when we go off record. <laughs> You know, yeah. thanks to Amber and Denise and Daniela and, and Mike for uh, putting the session together. Yeah. That should be and on Shelley. the recording. And Shelly. And Shelly, yeah. Um, it was, um, yeah. Yeah, Kai, go ahead and stop the recording in case there's something anyone wants to say off the record. 